Actually, we've learned in, in speaking to the choir on this. We know that wasn't such a great idea, and uh, the uh, ramifications of that are felt out here in the West uh, more so than we've ever did in the past. And you combine that with uh, with uh, what's happening with our climate, and if you get some of the stuff that these guys are saying, you know, we have some issues where yeah, fire can be one of those things that draws people together for um, to, to unite folks on issues because. Fire is doing, on one hand, it's doing heavy lifting of a lot of the management out here on the grounds, but it's also doing the most devastation. And you can't ever get anybody, and the, on the public side, really to agree. Um, you don't necessarily look for consensus when you're looking for something. Um, is the uh, is the uh, manager of that fire in the hands of the district rangers? So just a little bit of background on that. The, the way that the, uh, the fires work, uh, the fire works on national forest land is, is there are, there are decision makers, those, those are the line officers. I'm the line officer as a district ranger. Um, there's a line officer as a forest supervisor who is the, in charge of the entire forest and uh, his supervisor is the uh, regional forester. Um, the, the buck stops there. Um, when something goes wrong, uh, somebody above that usually hears about it, but uh, the buck pretty much stops right there. It's called the agency administrator. And the agency administrator on this is, is, the, uh, is the boss of the fire for the life of that fire. He's the manager of it, he owns it, he or she owns that fire. So the, um, what do you do, what values are at risk, um, what uh, resource, resource values are at risk, so what risk do you want to take with, with a certain type of fire, why is what the agency administrator. Um, when, a, when the fire bell rings, that's not the time to start a relationship. So if you're a district ranger, if you're, is it, may I ask a question, how many uh, Forest Service folks are in the room? There's a few. So at the, at the beginning of the season, this is when the fire bell rings, it's not the time to start building a relationship with somebody because inevitably something's not gonna go right because you're not gonna know really what the, what the resource needs are of, of the people in that community. And so you get a, you know, Obviously, you got to start that relationship building a, lot, a, lot, a long time before that. But the um, the agency administrators are are where the, again where the buck stops. So you know, you, a lot of us have been involved in campaign fires, large events where you know we had type two, type three, type one teams in there for a long time. You know, over and over, a new team comes in and out. There's new ICs that come and go, um, and their whole team that comes along with them. Some are good, some have some issues. Um, and, and you'll hear some of the community say, well, I worked really good with that team. Bring that team back, they worked really well. They, re they worked really well with us. Or don't bring that other team back in here ever again. They really messed up us. Well, really, it wasn't necessarily that team. It was the agency administrators. The agency administrators are the ones who give those teams what their objectives are from day one of when they come and they have an injury. Um, they tell the, the, the group of folks that are coming in that might not even have ever stepped foot on that piece of ground in, ever in their lives. But they know what they're doing to organ, organizationally and they have all the qualifications. But they might not have ever set, set foot on there, might not know the community, might not know all of, all of the, especially all the tribes that are involved, or how to deal with tribes to begin with, or how to deal with other publics. And so and the agency administrator is key key position to Figure out how how that that part of the ball game really works because you own it as the agency administrator. Um, I'm in a little bit of a little bit of a I get a get out of jail free card a little because I'm an agency administrator representative, and so I just represent the uh, forest supervisor. But so if something goes wrong, I could always say, "Oh, it was, it was Merv who, who messed that up." But um, you know. It really starts, it, that's, that's where it starts. And you know, there's all kinds of um, laws, regs, and policies, always, you know, work for a federal agency. There's no more red tape I've seen anywhere. Um, but there, there are opportunities there, and you gotta be able to wait, figure out a way that you can skin that cat in, in, in several different ways. So, um, it was said a little bit ago, I think, by Erica, that you know, there's, there's some places where we've had some really bad fires and people have lost their homes, people have lost a lot of resources. And in that same fire though, in some cases, there might have been somebody else that said, well geez, we got a lot of resource benefit. There was some good understory burns that went through some areas, 
um, a lot of plant life is going to be rejuvenated here in the next year. Um, it didn't it didn't do any sand replacing parts of that fire, and so you could have two ends of the spectrum on on just one fire event. So you really got to look at the situation how it is, and those those line officers, those agency administrators, spend a lot of time. Um, if they're good at what they do, they spend a lot of time with their communities figuring out what those values at risk are. In my part of the community, and, and um, uh, you met Butch and you mentioned um, Frank Lake, and Frank sitting in the back there with, with Bill, and uh, we work really closely with those guys. Um, I think when when we have a fire uh, out there, we have some MOUs that are in place, and I didn't put those MOUs in place. The, the crew tried worked with the Forest Service for a long time, and they had those MOUs in place where when the fire bell rings, um, we contact the tribe and invoke that invoke that uh, that MOU, and and we bring on both tribal representatives for a uh, government to government um, interaction about how we're going to manage that fire, and also we have a uh, that uh, that starts off the process for bringing in cultural resource folks. So I think that's pretty common across the country, um, but I think one of the things that we do is. Our order comes in pretty quick now, so Bill usually gets a number that's pretty low right off the bat, and, and he comes and he's a part of our um, part of our team, part of our injury. Um When we when we give a letter of delegation to the uh, to the teams when they come in, it, it discusses um, how how to interact with the tribe, what their role is going to be, along with along with some other other things that we put in that letter of delegation, but. Um, that's how you can make things work better, and it's really the relationship part of that. Because you don't, like I said, you don't want to start to build that relationship during an event. That's not the time to build it. You want to build it before then. Um, and so we've had we've had some pretty good successes with that. And uh, I compare it to back in just in our not so recent past in 2008, where there were some things that went really wrong, and that's not the way you want to work. And and I think uh, by putting some stuff in place like, like, like we have, I think that that's changed things quite a bit. And I think the management of, of fire, um, on the one hand, on wildfire, has, has improved in our neck of the woods. Um, and I think, I think that's a, a, a something that's a lot better for the Forest Service to represent as being more relevant to the community. But the second part of that is um, about fire, is you know, we're, we don't just talk about wildfire in our neck of the woods, we talk about prescribed fire. Because tribal folks have used fire in that neck of the woods since time immemorial and um, the you know and the message of put all fires out, you know, the tribes really didn't like that. The tribes wanted to try to figure out a way where yeah, some fire is good, allow some of that fire to occur and then you, you get away from this deferred risk and a whole lot of other stuff and there's a lot of resource benefit. Um, but when you have that challenge of you have a home right next to that or you have, you know, an infrastructure piece of the community right there, the water system, the, the you know, part of the part of the telephone system, and all those kind of things. But you have to try to figure out a way how you can do that. But that's where where those kinds of challenges get a little difficult. But when you talk about those ahead of time, you're that that much further ahead of the game. So I think, you know, to answer to the question, I think that's uh, one of the things that's that's evolving. I know it's not perfect everywhere. Uh, if you just go to the southern half of our state, it's the opposite. There's so many houses and people um, where that's not really an option. Um, down in Southern California, you know, there's a lot of wildfire. And up in our neck of the woods, we're fortunate we have more people than, I mean, more trees than people compared to the southern part of the state. That's funny. Um, Nolan references the, the benefits of wildfire, which of course are many. Then we get to the bad part about fire, which is all the houses that destroy it. So it is a two-edged sword. But the conversation reminds me that about six months ago, um, I interviewed one of the most interesting people I think I've ever talked to. And you will have the good fortune of meeting him on Thursday. Um, Dr. Paul Hesper, who's from Wenatchee, has been with the Forest Service for 30 I think 37 years. He's a landscape ecologist. Um, Paul went through kind of a life-changing experience the summer of the big wild, wildfire in Wenatchee, which was, I think, two summers ago. He had friends who lost houses. He didn't lose his, but he had friends who lost their houses. And I got into, it got into thinking about megafires. He's now 
done a presentation in I think 55 cities in the Western United States in which he attempts to explain fire to people who don't know anything about it except put the damn thing out as quickly as you can. Paul was a great believer in what he called managed fire, which looks to me to be about as close as you could get to what tribes did back in the days when fire was the only tool they had. And but Brian, this is actually a question for you because you're the one who works in the belly of the beast. I want to know if you can tell us if the idea of managed fire actually allowing large fires to roam the landscape where they can safely, is that idea even being discussed? So I can give you a one word answer to that, but first I'm gonna give you a whole lot of context that goes with it, how's that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, so one of, the, one of the interesting things about thinking about fire in the landscape is that um, right, you heard me say this before, fire is complex, it's complicated, it jumps boundaries. There's all these different elements that are involved in fire, and that's the ecological side of it. Another part of this that we've, we've all sort of been alluding to, probably more implicitly than explicitly, is, is the fact that the organizations that are managing fire and the organizations that are in charge of those particular management of those lands, so whether it's a tribal program, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Forest Service, whatever it is, these organizations are changing and they're changing rapidly. And, and by that I mean the dynamics within those organizations. So at one point, it's a very general statement, at one point, all people who worked in fire had some nexus to natural resource management. Those were the folks, it was the rangers, it was the park rangers, it was the resource specialists, and when smoke was in the air, they were running to the fire along with whoever else they could get to go with them. So if you look at the, the genesis of the different organizations, Forest Service started in 1905, the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 1824, the Bureau of Land Management in like 1832, somewhere in there, right? So you've got 100 plus years of development and growth in all these federal agencies that have some nexus to fire. And that's, I'm believing, I'm not discounting the, the other, you know, the other folks that have been involved in it far before that. But what, what happened was we have these, these federal agencies and organizations that really took this expert role. So if you looked at the Forest Service, there was foresters, rangeland, biologists, all the different natural resource specialists that came into it. And that was the training and the experience you needed to have to enter that particular discipline. In the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the long celebrated forest and fire program, tons of foresters and natural resource specialists have come through and actually built these programs into what we have today. So we have this organizational structure and this, I say the business of managing fire that's been built on the backs of years and years and years of growth and development. Well, so now, we have, now we're entering this different phase across the board and this is happening not just in the Forest Service and not just in the BIA and not just in the Bureau of Land. It's happening everywhere. And we're seeing this wave of, um, everyone's always talked about the wave of federal retirements, right? That's a really cliche saying that's out there. But what we're seeing is the, the decades of experience, the decades of technical prowess are actually moving on and doing other things. <laughs> folks are retiring, folks are moving on. So the organizational structure is still in place we're not having the pipeline of people to actually step in and do this. And so one of the things that was happening in the Forest Service when I, when I was working in the, the Forest Management Director role, the discussion